environment artist needs to know. At Camouflage, we actually created this art creation guide. Let me just grab that for you real fast. And in this guide, we talk about all the fundamentals every environment artist, every prop artist should know and try to implement to the best of their abilities. So we're just going to very quickly go through this list. And depending on time, we may have to make one or two additional videos that cover specific details in this document. And I just want to give you a very strong foundation of why we do these things, how to fix these issues, and how to correctly author content in a non-destructive way. So first off, every model must have a diffuse spec normal map. So regardless of what you're working on, if you think at some point you might need a normal map, create it when you're making your textures. Don't try to do a pass after the fact, because if you're in a production setting, that could mean hundreds of assets you have to rework. And the chances of you finding the high res, getting all set up again to rip all this information is slim to none. You're not going to have the time or the resources in most cases. Next, always render your textures at least double the resolution. And this is, this is very important because you might be shipping on mobile and that's one resolution. And if someone comes to you, gives you an offer, says, hey, hey, check out our console, check out Xbox One, check out PC. We're going to pay you to like make your game on this device. You don't want to have to go back through, recreate all your content once again at double the resolution to get the text density where you need it to be to hold up. So that's why you author your content at double the resolution and then clamp it within your editor. If you don't know what clamping means, I'm going to go over that briefly uh, in a couple of videos and you should have a better idea of like what that actually means. UV set one, at least for us, you don't actually have to follow this route necessarily, but for us to be able to get the amount of fidelity we had in Republic, we had to create a pipeline where we would actually atlas our content into this, what we more or less is an Uber atlas. So for instance, we'd have a scene that had up to 100 draw calls, 500 draw calls, and then we'd force all the similar textures into an atlas. So if I had a bunch of opaque stuff, I'd force it into an opaque atlas. I've had a bunch of transparent stuff that would go into a transparent atlas, so forth and so on. You do this to reduce draw calls. So I could take a scene with 100 draw calls and drop it down to about 10 draw calls just by having atlases. It's very important that you figure out a way to handle low-end devices and still keep up your fidelity. Next, every asset that was created has a second UV set for our light maps. And the reason we did that is because what we found, at least through Unity, is it was packing things inefficiently, in my opinion. We had a lot of dead space in our light maps, and we needed to figure out a way to round that. The best solution we had was authoring our own light maps. So learn how to do a second UV set if you haven't. I will touch on that briefly within 3D Max, but if you're a Maya user, Moto user, you should already know how to create a second UV set. Uh, Textile density, we already talked about that a little bit. 64 pixels per foot is what uh, Camouflage currently has for Republic. If we scroll down a little bit further, you can see that I've also listed off other games that I've come across documentation on. Half-Life 2, they had 48 pixels per foot. God of War 3, Halo 4, they had 73 pixels per foot. So this is nothing new. High-end studios use this technology. They try to hit texel density, and that's the reason their stuff looks so polished is because they try to hit these benchmarks. It's not easy to do, but when you do it, it's the difference between a AAA game and just something that you happen to see and like, okay, well, that had a decent story. Uh, next, if you're shipping on iOS, just remember that you always have to use square textures at the end of the day. When it hits device, it's going to force into a square texture. What do I mean by that? Well, if you author a 256 by 512, that will clamp to a 512 by 512. So you effectively lost any of the optimization you're going for because you've doubled the resolution or almost doubled it. So once again, if you had a 512 by 2048, it'd be a 2048 by 2048. Unless, of course, you've built a system that allows you to atlas, move these rectangular textures into an atlas that's square, then you don't have to worry about these ramifications. If you haven't figured out that pipeline, always use square textures for iOS. There's no way around it. Next, authoring textures. Always do a non-structive pipeline when you're authoring textures, meaning never collapse your layers unless you absolutely need to. Uh, organize it, have groups within your Photoshop file, meaning this group is diffuse. If you have a bunch of dirt and grime layers in your Photoshop file, you should call them dirt and grime folders. Have that organized because 
you need to always be accounting for that you might not be the only person that's having to author your content. Uh, you might check it in, and then I, me as like the environment lead or the art director comes in, realizes like, okay, well, this texture is too saturated. Um, there's too much grunge in this. I need to be able to go in there very quickly and start removing or dialing back some of those parameters. So if you collapse all your stacks, I can't do anything with it with the exception of starting from scratch. Uh, ideal saturation ranges and brightness ranges slash value ranges. This is probably new to a lot of people out there. They're probably just going through their typical workflow, building textures at any range. Don't do that. Because effectively, the moment you add lights to your scene, you start baking down, you're not going to allow any additional expansion for lights to influence your scene. Meaning, if I create a texture that's black, it doesn't matter if that object's in shadow or not. It's always going to look black on device. If I create an object that has 100% white, it's always going to look white on device. So the moment I put a light next to it, it's going to blow out. So that's why you always author your textures within a compressed range. So try to get into your head. 20 to 80 is your new 0 to 100. And that goes for saturation. That goes for brightness. So when you're authoring textures, just try to always stay with these parameters. Uh, a little bit further down, we talked about prefabs a little bit. Let's drag this down. Come on. There we go. Having some refresh issues. Um, there we go. Prefab right here, transformation, rotation. These are just standard uh, scale standards that you need to implement from 3D Max, my into U uh, Unity. Uh, naming conventions, we already talked about that a little bit. I provide documentation, like in-depth documentation about how camouflage is approached naming conventions. So with that said, we're just going to quickly fly through this scene that I have loaded up. And I'm just going to point out some issues, and then in later uh, lessons, we're going to try to fix some of them. So first off, in archives, it looks like this is a blurry wall in comparison to everything around it. It's probably a little bit easier if I turn this off. And you can see, but we have this nice fine detail right here, and that's being all but lost on this panel. So that'll be one thing we look at. Uh, once again, this saturation range right here is way too bright in my opinion. I mean, if I were to throw a light anywhere near this that was red, that would blow out. There'd be no room for the pixels to push into a, a brighter saturation range because I've already used that extent. Uh, once again, this ground does not look up to text density, so we're going to be looking into why that is. If we fly further down, you can also see this is blown out. So this is probably because the texture, once again, is authored too bright. We're going to try to fix for that. More resolution inconsistencies. I mean, it makes this entire wall look horrible because this was not authored correctly, this wall right here. All this stuff looks like it's the correct resolution, and that because this wall is so low res, it makes it look bad. It breaks the immersion. We're going to be talking about how to fix this stuff. We're going to be flying down here. Once again, brightness issues. Because these authors, these textures were authored incorrectly, this looks horrible. I mean, this could have been totally avoided if we would have just authored these textures differently. Yeah, and that's it. I mean, there's just a lot of things we have to tackle in here. And in the next lesson, I think we're going to probably start off with uh, texture authoring. We're going to go in, fix some saturation issues, uh, fix some value range issues, and see what that ends up taking this scene to. And yeah, with that said, compress value ranges and saturation ranges. The reason you do this is to avoid situations like this. We went through, we created all this great content, and then we lit the scene, and this light, it's not that bright. Like, if I click on this light, and I pull this over, the light intensity of this is 0.9. The most I almost ever use in Unity, for at least Republic, is a 1. I might go to, like, 1.1, 1.2, but overall, when I hit intensity, I almost never go past 1, because, in my opinion, 1 means that light is on full force. Anything past that is effectively a multiplier. So you'd use that for neon lights, maybe, halogens. But most of the time, you always want to have things within the 0 to 1 on this range. So with this light then being at 1, there's no reason this wall should blow out. This immediately tells me that this texture is authored incorrectly, that the person who created this texture was not using a compressed value range. So if I fly down here, you look down this hallway, once again, this is using all the same textures that we saw in the other corner, and it just further validates that these textures are authored incorrectly. 
This is just way too bright. So let's fix that in this lesson and see what we can do. So I open this up. Let's see if I can't find that white panel, which is this right here. And let's just quickly look at what the ranges are. I have to hit cancel, make sure I'm not actually on this mask layer. Click around, and if you look at the brightness, it's staying 70s, 74s. There might be an 80 in here somewhere, but that's pretty high. I mean, I'd almost never use a texture at this level of brightness for a wall like this. This is like concrete, metal. I think the brightness I would use is more like 30 range. So let's see if we can uh, get that to happen. I'm just going to take this. I'm going to drop this down. What I feel is about 30%. And let's try that. Let's see what happens if I now sample this. Once again, cancel. I have to go up here to this layer. I'm at 40s. 40s isn't too bad. This already looks, in my opinion, a lot better. I mean, we have it muted down. We have some decent detail. If anything, I might want to increase the contrast a little bit. Try something like that. Let's go ahead and save this and see what happens to our scene. I'm just going to pull this down so I can quickly access it. And look at that. Just by tweaking that one texture, all of this blown out information that we had is effectively gone. Granted, we have some other very bad issues, like this wall right here is obviously not, not within texel density, so try to look past that. And what I mean is this resolution is definitely not the same as that. So we're going to be addressing this in a later lesson. So for right now, just kind of look at intensity. Look at what the lights are doing and how it's affecting this. And this looks a lot better. So the next thing we're going to look at is this right here. This panel right here is way too bright. And it's, once again, the same issue that we just came across. We're going to open up that texture now trims and you can see this is authored way too bright and once again it's this layer right here i effectively broke this just for this demonstration just to show you how bad this can get and let's look at the value range of this let's pull this down a little bit and start sampling and that's roughly in the 80 range this is the upper end of the spectrum that we should ever use for brightness and it's way too bright so once again, we're going to hit OK. We're going to go to this. We're going to drop down the levels on this. Let's do something like that. And we're going to save this. Let's see what happens. We're going to go back to Unity. And there we go. That already looks 100% better. Like if you just focus your eyes just on this, that looks shippable. That, I mean, we might want a little bit more contrast, but that looks 100% better. And I think you would agree. I'd say the next jarring issue is saturation. This texture is way too saturated. That texture is way too saturated. I would never expect to see this level of saturation unless I had a red light up here shining onto a red surface causing this to happen. So once again, let's go into Photoshop and let's see if we can't fix that. Let's go to our red panel. Here we go. Here's the red. Let's see if I can't pull this open a little bit more. And I want you to just kind of watch this red line down here. We're going to tweak the saturation now. Once again, this is set to 100% saturation, which we should almost never do. I'm going to set it to about 80. Now let's just use the highest we can possibly do. And we're going to allow the light to actually take over the rest of this information if it needs to. I'm going to darken it up. I think that looks good. Yeah, that has a decent feel to it. Save that. And it feels muted right now, but the big thing is, is because it was so saturated before that this, even though it may be correct now, looks wrong. So you just have to like live with it for a little bit. We're going to go to the next texture. And in my opinion, this is way too saturated again. In this case, they actually have the color embedded in the color overlay. So we're just going to double click on that. Click on this. Saturation's at 90. I think we could just drag that down. Try to get a little bit closer to what that line is. Let's try that. I feel like the saturation is still too high. Hit OK. That doesn't feel too bad. Save that. And there we go. So this may feel a bit muted, but once again, if this feels wrong, I'd actually argue that it feels wrong not because the texture is authored not with enough saturation, but because it's not meeting our texel density. 
So keep that in mind. We're going to leave these as is, and we're going to move on to some other issues that we see. So these floors right here, these obviously are not texel density. I mean, this is way too blurry. It doesn't match the wall right next to it or the ground next to it. So let's see if we can't fix this. I'm going to click on the ground. I'm going to open up my inspector. Window, inspector. There we go. And let's see if we can't find that texture. So concrete. And that's the reason. This texture has been clamped to 64 by 64. Um, let's just go ahead and see 4096 and see what happens. So it can go all the way up to 1024, but I'd actually say this is overkill. The amount of resolution we have here in contrast, even though it looks a lot better, it feels off to me still. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a feature that is actually created by one of our technical artists. It allows us to check textile density on the fly in game. And let me just find our art tools. I'm going to pull that over. And we're just going to quickly see if we can't troubleshoot some of these textures. Set uh, density of texture, hit change. And what this does is figures out what size texture everything is using and then throws a tileable texture on it so you see, can see very quickly what has too much resolution and what doesn't. So yeah, I can already tell this is probably about double the resolution we need because if this is the truth right here, which I already know it is, that is effectively, yeah, about two times, if not four times larger. And what I mean by that is like, if you see this, these four right here represent that. So I could actually cut the resolution of this in half. So let's hit undo. Let's click this, set the resolution. We're going to clamp this down to 512 and hit apply. And come on, art tools. Let's change it. That looks a lot better. Looks good. So with that said, I'm going to stop this video and we're going to move on to get everything to be as consistent resolution as possible. So with that said, let's just kick it off where we left off and here we are. So in the last episode, we were taking this concrete texture and trying to get it to the correct resolution. If I hit change, you can see that now by clamping this texture to 512, it is starting to feel a lot more accurate based off the walls around it. The next texture we need to address is this texture right here. So I'm going to hit undo. And this is deceiving. This is more of a memory issue than a textile density issue because, I mean, it has enough resolution to be our textile density, but the catch is the amount of memory overhead is drastic. This is four times the size, at least, of this 512. So let's fix that. I'm going to click here. Gonna click this texture, open that texture. So this is a 2048. That's huge. Uh, we don't even, I mean, in most cases, we use 2048s for atlases only. I've never seen a texture add a 2048 by default. I mean, let's look at this tiling. You can't tell me this is 32 feet worth of information. There's no way. So just by looking at what we have here, I'd say at the most, this is a 512, the very most. So let's do 512, scroll down, hit apply, and watch this. Did you see a change there? Let me do it again. Let me go back to 2048, hit apply. Cycles, uncompresses, come on, can do it. There we go. I didn't see a noticeable change. That's what I'm getting at. You need to figure out what your texture density is and make sure textures are being clamped to that because in most cases, if you don't, you're going to be wasting memory overhead. So once again, watch this very carefully. I'm going to hit 512 again and watch the amount of resolution that you end up losing in this process. Little to none. It actually looked like it got sharper, which is crazy. And it might actually have based off of uh, mipping. So this actually looks a lot better now. So let's go back to my tool, hit change. Look at that. We have consistent resolution all the way across here now. Going to go down further. These are decals. Doesn't look too bad. I mean, this is a little bit smaller than I'd like, but I think that's fine for our needs. Scroll down. Oh, we have this garbage bag over here. This is obviously too much resolution for what it is, and let's try to fix that. I'm going to click on the garbage can, clip the texture. This texture is uh, 1024. Let's scroll down and let's try to set this to 512 again. Let's just see if 512 is the magic number. Once again, it just turned into 512. I don't see a difference. 
There might not even be a visual difference here. And that looks perfect. This is what I'm getting at. Save yourself memory. Use texel density. Look at this texture right here. That is so much resolution that I, it blows my mind. Like, you don't need a texture that with that amount of resolution. I mean, I zoom back, you can hardly even tell. And the reason this gets so blurry is because of mipping. You have very little control over that. So let's go ahead and fix this. Let's go to this texture. There we go. This texture is a 2048. Can you believe that? That's way over the double the resolution mark. So let's go in here. I'm guessing based off this object size, let's try a 128. I mean, we obviously lost a lot of resolution here, but let's see what happens when we get into game. Turn this on again, change. And honestly, I didn't see that big of a difference. I mean, it mips out still from a distance, but it's readable up close. So this is at your own discretion at this point. I mean, maybe this could be a 256. But without actually going into the engine, yeah, I didn't even see a change there, so I'm just going to leave this at a 128. There is no visible change happening here. So that looks fine. So let's turn on this one more time, see if we missed anything. Looking around. Looks correct resolution. That looks... Oh, that's probably right, just that it's such a small texture. This is obviously a texel density issue associated with UVs or scale, one of the two. Fly around, and I think we might have fixed all the major issues with the exception of this panel over here. And this looks like it's about, needs to be cut in half, so let's fix that real fast. Click this texture. 1024 currently, let's drop this down to 512. There you go, it just clamped it down to 512, still looks good in my opinion. Go back to game, change, and I really don't see a difference. I mean, the big issue right here is just how dark this is. I'm just going to pull some of this over so you can actually see the light map again. There we go, and that looks fine. That looks good. That looks appropriate for what it should be. Let me just bring this back up again. I hit undo, and no significant change here. Like, I didn't lose any information. It looks sharp. I mean, think about how little we've done just now. If you guys can remember back to the previous lesson, we had textures that were oversaturated. This was completely blown out, looks good from a distance. We had textures that were oversaturated, we fixed that. I think the next thing we need to do is start addressing the text density issues, like fixing scale, fixing uh, UVs in the actual source file, and seeing how much further we can push this. So with that said, I'm going to leave this lesson and we're going to jump into fixing scale and textual density. So let's kick it off. This is the third part series of this lesson and see what we can do. So first off, this wall looks incorrect. Let's just go ahead and grab this, pull in the inspector and see if we can't figure out what is the issue. And immediately I see this value right here. I see 1.02, 1.02, and then I see 11 right here. That immediately tells me that someone's taken this asset and by default, it should all be one, but they've actually scaled it up 100%. So let's just go ahead and take this, copy that, paste that in there, and look at that. Immediately, it already starts feeling better. It doesn't seem to fix our uh, textile density issues, but as for scale and distortion, I think that's a lot better. So I'm just going to go to my keypad, hit V for vertex snap, snap it to that wall, grab this wall by holding down control, and we're just going to pull this forward a little bit. There we go. And that looks a lot better. Yeah, that looks good. Let's go down here and see if we can't do the same thing with this wall. Let's grab this. And it looks like the same issue. It looks like it's somehow this uh, object's gained a 16% scale. Let's pull that back. And it looks like there's actually a redundant wall here. Let's dupe that. And... I mean, I don't even think we have to change this. I mean, the light map looks correct on this. All this stuff has AO around it. So, yeah, we're at this point, I almost think we have to fix the text density of this object to get this to look correct. So let's look into that first and then go from there. So I'm going to click this guy. This is called int brig wall 2. So we're going to go to the max file and see if we can't find that corresponding thing. Int brig wall 2 meters AO1. So this is the wall in question right here. So I'm going to open up text tools, which you should already be familiar with. First thing I'm going to do is hit checker. So 
I know immediately after looking at this, this is authored incorrectly. It shouldn't look like this. And what I mean by that is if I click on this object, hit checker, this looks like the correct textile density. This is tiling of 512 texture at what I would consider the correct rate. So let's go back to this, hit this twice, three times, there we go. So let's see if we can't fix this. So I'm guessing that this probably should be a 512, but let's just go ahead and go through the process. We open this up, these are the UVs. The UVs are almost non-existent because I'm guessing it's packing based off a of 1024 or 2048 possibly. But what we can do here with text tools and this features, we can go down here, open up IDs, and start selecting faces. So let's grab these faces first, and I just want to do isolated uh, processes here, just so I can try to approach this at different rates. So I'm just going to focus on these faces first. I'm going to right-click down here to implement this textile density, which we've already uh, <clears throat> proved that 512 equals 5 feet for a republic. Right-click on it, cycles, and then look at that. That looks a lot better. If you remember what this guy looked like, let's just toggle it on one more time. That looks consistent. That looks like the correct resolution. So let's do that for the rest of these panels. Select this. It's this large face right here. Let's run the process on it. That's fixed. And you can already tell it's taken up a lot more space than the zero to one, which is great. That's exactly what we're looking for. We're trying to fix texel density and we're trying to use as much space within our zero to one as possible. So let's just open this up one more time. Go to two. Let's fix all these faces. I'm going to right click on it. Cycling. There we go. Probably seems a bit redundant, but we're just going to keep on doing this. We're going to fix all these faces to the best of our ability. For this, I'm going to hit a relax to make all this stuff unified. All this stuff should be one to one to itself now. Now I'm going to run this process again. Right click. There we go. Looks a lot better. We do have a seam issue, but that's not what we're here to fix right now. We're just here to fix texel density. Open this up one more time. And four. That looks fine. Six. That looks fine. So I think we're good to go. I mean, we have decent texel density for this asset. So all we have to do is close that down, hit this three times to go back to the default. And the great thing about text tools is you can see me doing it is when I'm clicking this, it cycles through all these tileable maps. And when it gets back to this, it actually reapplies the materials that you had on it initially. It's non-destructive. That's great. It allows you to iterate very quickly. So let's go ahead and export this. All right. If I remember correctly, it's under int brig, this file right here. Yes. And scale this down so we can actually see some of the properties. And there we go. It's all set up for meters, Y up, OK. And now let's go back to Unity. See if these walls look any better. It's importing, importing. I mean, look at that. That looks 100% better. Do you guys remember what this looked like? It was a blurry mess. And this actually looks consistent with the world around it. That's what I mean about text density. This label looks correct on this wall. These control panels, these pieces of paper look correct on this wall now. That's what textile density will give you. It will give you consistency. Let's look at this wall. All right, so this still has an issue. This still has textile density issues. Let's click on that. This is called Brig Wall 1 Meter AO1. Let's see if we can't fix that. Let's see, Brig Wall 1 Meter AO1. I think this is it. Let's hit this. Yeah, once again, same textile density issue. This time, however, because I already know. I went through the same process with that last wall. I can almost guarantee the UVs are set up in the same fashion. I'm just going to run this process on everything. Let's right click, right click one more time. It's going to sample everything and it's going to run that process on it. And look at that. Immediately we have text density that's consistent throughout. So one thing to remember about this is this only works if you have the same resolution for each one of your tileable textures. In this case, we do. So if, for instance, like this was sampling a 512, this was sampling a 1024, we would have to go through the process of changing the size based off those shells that we end up grabbing for that face. So just keep that in mind. Cycle back through. Let's export this one more time. Overwrite that and see if this fixes our uh, textile density issue. Reduce this. Unity's loading up. It's going to do it. And look at that. Looks 100% better. 
just in that few minutes, we've taken these walls, we fixed the texel density, and they look 100% better. Everything feels natural now. I mean, this is the difference between indie developers that don't understand the principles of texel density and not implementing it when they should. So with that said, the next video is just going to be going through, fine-tuning a few more things, talking about principles and why you should be authoring content in this fashion. And things over this last uh, few sessions, we learned about compressing color ranges, brightness ranges. We learned about texel density. We learned about the importance of scale conventions. We learned about optimizing UV space using UV set one and two. We learned about a bunch of modeling tools in 3D Max. And now to top it all off, we're just going to look at this scene that we help polish up. And then, provided that there's time, I'm going to be showing you how to take a standard prop object and you've already gone through the process of creating all these textures for it and this thing, the art director comes up to you and says, hey, I actually need this to be a hero object. You have one day. How can you effectively take that one asset and make it into a hero object in no time flat within 3D Max? All right, with that said, let's look at our scene and get this kicked off. So here we are in uh, Unity. Everything looks a hundred times better in my opinion. I think you would agree. If I hit play, give it a couple seconds to load up, we can look at the text density. Most of it should be consistent because we took care of a lot of those issues. So text density, change. Let's look around. It looks all very consistent. We have a few small areas, but I'm not too worried about that for right now. We fix a lot of issues. We uh, found out the importance of actually having the compressed color range so you could actually have lights that represent real lights, meaning full range, and not have to blow out your textures. So we've done a lot of very interesting things here, and I think uh, it's paid off. I think if you look at these uh, red textures that seem desaturated at the time, look 100 times better. I didn't change anything about it. It's just the fact that we came back to it we let our eyes adjust based off the saturation they used to be at, and it feels a lot better. I mean, look how natural that feels. It just looks like it's a brightly lit section, and yeah, I'd be happy to ship a game that is at this quality. So with that said, let's just uh, turn off play mode, uh, close down Unity, open up 3D Max, and here we go. Here's the tape rec recorder. This tape recorder is just a standard prop. I'll show you the texture real fast. Let's pull that in the screen, shrink this down. Let's see, just like that. Double click on the texture and you can see we have a lot of overlapping elements here. I mean, this is a very efficient pack job. This is great. I mean, this is exactly what you need to do. So we're going to disregard these few elements because these are actually separate textures. We're just gonna be focusing on this tape recorder. How can I turn this into a hero prop in zero time flat? All right. So with that said, let's just reduce this, grab this object, and let's go to text tools. So what we're gonna end up doing here is we're gonna create a second UV set. Uh, yes to this, and then it already has a second UV set already laid out. This is the UVs for the light map. And we might be able to just repurpose a lot of this information possibly, but first of all, let's just look at this guy. How is he set up? Do Let's go ahead and grab this edge right here and see if we can't just discern. Okay, well, these strips right here represent this outline. These represent the arms. I think that's fine. The back is shrunk down because you don't need a lot of resolution for that. So I'd say this is a decent pack job for the most part, but let's see if we can make it a little more efficient. We're just gonna take some elements, scale them up, because if we're gonna have to spend the cost of making this a hero object, might as well use all the space possible. Rotate these elements, pull over here. There we go. And finally, I'm just gonna do a quick weld. There we go. So I welded all the additional segments that I felt I could get away with. And I think that's a decent pack job. So now, watch this. Not many people know about this. I'm gonna close down text tools, go rendering, render settings. Render to texture. There we go. This takes a second to load up. All right, I'm going to convert this to a poly because I want to accept all those UV changes that we've done. 
And from here, I'm going to say bake into channel two. That's my new UV channel. And the great thing about render to texture is whatever you have displayed on your model will rip into whatever channel you're de describing in your channel up here. So what that means is I can go down here, add, I'm going to add a complete map. I'm going to add diffuse and specular. I'm not going to bother with a normal map because this actually doesn't have one authored. So we're just going to add these elements. And then I'm going to set all these to 1024s. There we go. I'm going to output into source and scroll up here real fast, see where it's saving to. And it's saving to my desktop, render to. Let's verify that it's still there. Yep, we are good to go. So the great thing about this is it's not really rendering. It's transferring pixel for pixel into your second UV set. So it's typically super fast, and it gives you really good results. And actually, now that I think of it, let's just do 24 to 8. Might as well over here. And then we're going to shift this guy over. And I'm just going to do this for visualization reasons. And let's grab this guy again, and let's render this out. I want a complete map, a specular map, and a diffuse map. OK. It's going to take a couple seconds. Um, like in the previous video, I'm actually suppressing the renderer. I'm just letting it do its own thing behind the scenes. It's always a lot faster if you do that. So that's finished. Now let's find the render to texture folder. Do, do, do. There it is. I'm going to pull this off to the side just so it's easier for me to drag the textures into my 3D Max file. I can close down this window now. And now I'm going to dupe this shader and I'm going to hook up the new materials or textures that it's created for me. So here we go. Oh. <sighs> Fighting panels right now. I'm going to grab these three textures. So one, two, and three. And now let's just hook this up. I'm going to put my diffuse map, which is right here, I believe. Yep, this is diffuse map. Plug that in. This is probably my spec map. Yes, it is. There we go. And let's look at the maps that's actually created. Let's double click on these guys. Look at that. You're not going to get much better than that. I mean, there's almost no loss in the texture rip. It just carries over a one-to-one. -one. I now have all unique UV space. This is very important. The one thing you do lose by doing this operation, keep in mind, is you're losing your layers, but you're gaining everything else. So let's go ahead and apply this to this object over here. I mean, I've just effectively created this in no time flat. We're going to change this textures channel to two and then wait for it to update grab this one change it to two and there we go look at that one to one it's a hero object now and you can texture at your own discretion so with that said I've just taught you one more thing to put in your tool chest now you know how to take your object that you created as a standard object turn it to a hero object and at this point, you can just add a lot of wear and tear, no time flat to this. And I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to learn about what it actually takes to create a AAA game. It's not always easy, but as long as you implement the theory I've provided to you in these lessons, you will be creating better looking artwork. I promise you that. With that said, Camouflage Game Studios, Digital Tutors, Jeff Matthews, Ryan Payton, Summer Daves, thank you guys so much for all your overwhelming support. Uh, and then all the game content provided to you guys, the viewers, that was provided to you by our game Republic. All the artists that worked on that made this happen. So Jeremy Romanowski, Sean Monte Plazier, Michael Fiedler, Andre Rue, thank you guys so much for your hard work and your dedication. It's so appreciated. You make my life so much easier. You have no idea. And yeah, to wrap this up, thank you guys once again so much for watching the video. Tell your friends. Contact me sometimes. Howareyou.com. How are you at hotmail.com? And let me know how things are going. I'd love to see the artwork you're creating and know that you got some value from my video.